I don't often get to talk on science, humanities, the arts and wider social policy. Some people think that I talk about everything and nothing in particular, so this seemed like a great opportunity to do exactly that. I'd want to deal with the mind and its potential at one level, which we all do, in thinking about ourselves. But usually the way that I would come about this topic is a bit the other way around. It's in the collective sense. And it is a pleasure, actually, to talk in an international house with an organisation that is committed to international fellowship and to the wider community in which we live. So the way that I'd normally go about getting into the topic of your own mind is to start with the collective mind and the way that we might see that. And the best example of that at the moment is a concept that is out there brought to us by the British, I'm afraid to say, of the mental wealth of nations. It's not a typo, it's not the mental health of nations, it is the mental wealth of nations. And the way in which, at a whole population base, as well as as individuals, we might set about maximising our cognitive and behavioural potential. And rather than just talk the talk, sometimes, occasionally, people do things about it. They walk the walk. And in this case, I'm very grateful to a previous visionary of this university, Gavin Brown, the previous Vice-Chancellor. I was just explaining to someone in the audience. I spent a good deal in my career not necessarily coming onto this campus until persuaded by Gavin Brown that this university really was going to do something very serious in an area in which it may not have been making as large a contribution as it had in the past for a series of cultural and, and historical reasons, but also because the technology, the opportunity, the social attitudes were such that it had been hard to make progress in the area of mental health and related illnesses. And for those who don't know it, this particular set of buildings uh, here is part of the University of Sydney, opposite Camperdown Park, and it is the Brain and Mind Research Institute. In fact, it's not the whole institute now. There's now a third building due to another visionary, although not often seen that way, Morris Yemmer, who funded the university to develop a whole other centre related to youth mental health, which now sits behind those buildings. So our university now has one of the largest investments in the country in this particular area. And the vision of Gavin Brown and, and my co-scientific director, Max Bennett, was actually not to be internally looking, but was to be actually externally looking, the way in which this university might use its potential, its people, its capital, its infrastructure, to set about making a significant contribution to the lives of people in our community and, in the end of the day, to the wealth and health of our community in Australia and also internationally. The concept of the mental wealth of nations is summarised in a report put together by the UK Government Office of Science in 2008. It's a thousand-page report in several volumes, but if you ever want to read the short version, there's a three-page marvellous summary in Nature in October 2008, just prior to the global financial crisis. And in a classically UK kind of way, they were really interested in somewhat the same sort of discussion that I'd had with Gavin Brown and Max Bennett in how you might maximise people's potential over time in terms of their cognitive and behavioural resources. Of course, the British didn't take such an individual view, they took a collective view, which was that really, for developing and developed countries, their long-term prosperity, both economically and socially, would depend on their capacity to utilise their citizens' cognitive resources on an ongoing basis. And it's important to say what a, co what a cognitive shift that is in thinking about GDP and growth and health and outcomes, to say, actually, it's the cognitive resources of people in our society that require for classical economic outcomes and for social outcomes. It's kind of interesting, I think, in terms of what has happened over the last decade and certainly in the last few years about economics, uh, just prior to the global financial crisis, what you would invest in if you wanted to make a difference in the long term. Basically, the UK Government of Science looked at all of the science that was out there and how it would inform public policy, not just in health, but in education, in social services, in welfare, in social development, in infrastructure, in all those sets of issues, climate change included, that would matter in the long term and how you would go about that, how the science may actually contribute and interact with public policy. Interesting in terms of the other dominating themes of the last few years beyond time, beyond the economic, many relate to the social environment and, of course, the fearfulness that now characterises many of our societies and the fearfulness of others that characterises many of our societies and what it is as a society that you need to hang together and work together and prosper socially as well as economically and the extent to which mental health and cognitive resources and behavioural capacity is at the centre of that and how that would actually happen. Now, there's a little five-word uh, five sentence at the end of the introduction of this whole report about early interventions being the key, that if you recognise the problems that are faced and if you want to make the most difference, you actually need to intervene early 
in all of the areas that I've previously mentioned if you want to make a difference. One of the classic sad differences between the mental health domain and nearly all other areas of health is, in fact, that we are preoccupied with late interventions. These are not things that we talk about. They're not things that we easily share. So we have typically waited in the educational environments, in the health environments, in the social environments, in the justice environments, until things go really wrong, a bit like the climate change situation, until things go really wrong, and then we try and work our way out of the situation from there. In dealing with early interventions, one isn't just dealing with childhood or with the intrauterine period, one's dealing with the opportunity right across the lifespan. So when I talk about early intervention, I don't mean just what happens in the first few weeks in the womb or the first few weeks in life. I actually mean what happens across the whole life cycle as opportunities arise for intervening to maximise your individual or your collective cognitive and behavioural capacities across your whole life, as well illustrated in this diagram that comes out of the Nature article. Now, I often show this in universities, and I don't know if you can see quite the peak of this, but actually, according to the World Bank, the most valuable person in a society is a 22-year-old. Now, I got a few of these in my family, and it causes me much grief to concede <laughs> that they, from an economist's point of view, are the most valuable person. And you might ask, why? Well, if you think about it, we invest an enormous amount through a very long developmental period in the health and welfare and social capacity of our young people. And they reach their maximum capacity at around age 22. As I say to my children all the time, the expectation is they'll start to pay back on that investment for a very long period. And we expect them to maintain their capacity over the course of your life. But it's important the thing to think about, about how long it takes us to reach that maximum capacity and what we do to maximise that, and then how we maintain that across the course of our life and how increasingly we may maintain it into later life, which is an issue I'll return to later on. And there are opportunities where things may go well, we may promote our mental health, our cognitive capacity, and there are things that may go wrong along the way. Contrary to a lot of thinking in this area, and a lot of traditional thinking in this area, it isn't all about what's in your genes, although perhaps some of us could have selected our parents better. Certainly my children say that on a regular basis in order to have had better capacities. It isn't all decided in the intrauterine period. It isn't all decided in how much paid parental leave there is in the first six months of life. It's a continuing, ongoing process. And certainly the developmental period should be seen as a very long one. And certainly ones where universities and the community that runs in this house are terribly important still in influencing the long-term outcome and the capacity of the graduates of this house and of this university to contribute not only to their own cognitive wealth, but to the wealth of the community in which they live. So the two particular points of view that constantly dominate my thinking about thinking about these areas are one about the population-based point of view, not just about how each individual we prosper within our own heads, but you know what are the social and community views and what are the areas of public policy where these things are incredibly relevant. They're most obvious, of course, in health when they go wrong. They're somewhat obvious in education, in terms of how much we realise that education matters to one's long-term capacity to contribute. Certainly the extent to which social services back people's capacity to develop are relevant. And that's fundamentally relevant, however, to the economic capacity of our societies and, of course, to their sustainability. And I'm very glad to see this university established a Centre of Sustainability with Sam Moyston as the director, which is as much about people as it is about physical infrastructure. And then what we all tend to be individually preoccupied with, of course, is our own individual health and what's going on in our own heads. And it's such an unusual thing in terms of brain science. We're all constantly experiencing through our cognitive and emotional relationship with the world that thing which is happening at some degree through our brains, through our heads. But we don't experience it in quite the same way. And certainly when it goes wrong is we experience sort of breathlessness or we experience chest pain or pains in our joints in a particular way when they're not working. We recognise the beauty of it without kind of recognising the beauty of it. We just sort of take it for granted until it goes wrong. And in the medical science world, we've had very little capacity to look at it and understand it and show it back to people in real time until very recently and to understand even basically what is going on. And like all great areas of science, it turns out most of what we've been saying about what's going on in there is probably wrong for a long period of time. But now we can say, well, we know a bit more. As a capacity of knowing more, our capacity to understand how to manipulate that world, how to make that world better, what the benefits might be and how to assist those who might be struggling has also grown. So the individual opportunities for improving cognitive and behavioural performance are now firmly on the agenda, in particular, not only in treating illness but maximising outcomes.
key to my general kind of thesis, however, is not just what the individual does. It's the opportunity provided by settings that creates those opportunities on an ongoing basis. The whole dominant paradigm actually in the areas in which I work is the ones of gene-environment interactions. And it's a fascinating kind of area because it's got to do with actually maximising environments, maximising the capacity that we actually provide. And fundamental issues of equity and distribution of resources arise in that environment. Of course, as I'll, I'll allude to, the more you do that, the more you provide enriching environments, the more that those who are more genetically gifted also benefit. So it's a funny thing about maximising environments. Rather than making people more equal, actually, they allow people to be more different in the long run. And I think in terms of the person this lecture is named after, is an excellent example of that. Of, in fact, in the right environment, you can prosper in a completely different way than in other environments you might be very constrained. So, in fact, maximising the environment, which from a brain point of view is really important to what we're doing at the moment, also, in a funny way, creates new inequities. I would suggest new responsibilities for those who have the greater gifts to contribute. The basic science perspective has also been influenced by two fundamental shifts in the science. One is an idea of the developing brain. Now, like a lot of ideas about the developing brain, we had an idea that genes always mattered. Clearly, for those like myself who are fortunate enough to have many children, they're not all the same when they're born. There are fundamental differences, physiologically, temperamentally, cognitively. However, it ain't all over in terms of development in a very short period. The developing brain concept one is now of a very prolonged period of dynamic development. Not preset, not simply pre-coded, not simply following the architect plan, not simply genetically determined, but one in which the developmental process itself is strongly influenced by the environmental exposures that take place, positively and negatively. And hence the key role of social education and environmental inputs on the one hand, maximising the environment for the responsiveness of the brain and minimising harm through toxic exposures or brain-related illness through that whole 22-year on average period. I'm afraid this is very burdensome for parents and others who feel responsible. You know? If you thought you could be out at five or when they went to school or out when they went to secondary school or out, forget it. You know, 22 at least until you maximise that investment. The other is for the rest of us, for the whole of our life, is the notion of the changing brain and the extent to which now that we can look at what the brain is doing and particularly the connections between nerve cells and even the genesis of new nerve cells within the brain so that the paradigm of the day is one of a changing brain, of a plastic brain that is changing constantly in relation to its lifelong challenges and experiences. And if you hear the story of the person, uh, Walter, who this lecture is named after, it's one of changing experiences and changing challenges and changing things. You know, it's not a preset life in terms of one's attitude to that life, one's sets of experiences and certainly one's cognitive and behavioural capacities. And that is a very optimistic view in one level of capacity for change, for recovery, for enhancement constantly, but it's also one in which there are constant difficulties if one finds oneself in adverse environments on an ongoing basis. So rather than a, what would have been the 19th and 20th century, and certainly to the mid-20th century view, of a brain within a box that's not largely seen and is determined by genetic factors and is largely fixed, or as we've taught in medical schools for generations, for about 100 years, you've got all the neurons you've got at birth and you just lose them after that. <laughs> You know, an idea of a preset, prefixed machinery kind of thing that's relatively unresponsive, in fact, to the environment around it. That's a totally transformed paradigm in terms of the modern science. In fact, if you track brain development in the child and adolescent period, there are two or three critical periods to look at. One is of childhood. And what this graph shows, for those who can see, and I apologise for the architecture of the room if you struggle to see, is a large upswing in what are called synaptic connections. They are the things that sit between nerve cells, like fingers on the end of your arm, that are constantly changing. For a child, every new smell, every new colour, every encounter generates millions of synaptic connections on an ongoing basis. It's a total explosion of connections in relation to environmental experiences. Enriched environments, enriched opportunities, every new sound, every new instrument, every new soccer ball, every new person, every different face, every different smell creates thousands, millions, not thousands, millions of new synaptic connections. So there's an explosion throughout the childhood period of those connections, of the brain just sort of mushrooming going boom in terms of just taking in every new things that happens. And those who spend time with small children will be aware of that kind of phenomenon, the extent to which they are just fascinated with every new thing and storing that thing in a particular sensory type way. 
Trouble is, from an energy point of view, the body can't sustain this kind of thing. There's a danger that the energy required to keep that thing going overwhelms the physical body. And what happens in late childhood and the onset of puberty is that it reaches its zenith and then starts through the adolescent period to prune those connections. If you think about it, when you learn to do something, you don't actually want to be totally preoccupied with it every time, as if it is new, as if it is novel. You want a whole lot of things to move out of consciousness and become efficient and become, in a way, made into more efficient pathways. And that's literally what the brain is doing during the post-pubertal and adolescent period, and not something just of the first few years of adolescence. These pruning graphs are really about running right into the early 20, uh, 20 period and, and somewhat later in boys who start puberty later than girls, somewhat earlier in girls in terms of finishing. Then there's this long period throughout life where basically this stays the same. And there's some period towards the end of life, and this is now much debated, about depending on what happens and what other illnesses you get, the extent to which you may reach a critical period where you have trouble maintaining this degree of synaptic connection. Though this is hotly debated in terms of what you're actually doing at that particular period. If, and as long as you're not ill, as long as you don't develop another illness that interferes with that, the brain's continuing capacity to do this in a much later life. So we are seeing 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds and now those over the age of 100 who maintain their cognitive capacity. It is not inevitable that you lose your cognitive capacity. What you do as you age may be fundamental. Uh, I come from a family that loves education. Uh, my, my father, who's now 84, graduated again from this university when he was 81, just to show you could do it again. I think he refused to pay the hex fee, and we said he was unemployable in terms of paying it back. <laughs> but, you know, it still remains one of the best ways to prevent ending up in a nursing home and dementing is to remain in education, to remain socially enrolled. I had the pleasure of being involved in the 2020 summit, some may remember back in 2008, and was one of only two people in the health field who voted for the notion of abolishing retirement. Since the average age of people in the room was about 60, most were in favour of retirement, they thought. But if you want to know how to lose brain capacity, retire. Right? Don't retire. In fact, throughout your life, in terms of driving synaptic connection, the two things that, well, three things that we know matter most, social interaction, education and employment, are the challenges. They're the things a brain turns around to and says, these are really important and they're complex and they require capacity to stay with them on an ongoing basis. Fortunately, at a university like ours anymore, you don't get chucked out when you turn 65 or 75. As long as you keep doing what you're doing well, and some of the best people I work in this university are now well into their 70s, they are the most active and, from my point of view, the most interesting because they're the most impatient. They do feel that perhaps they'll get to the end here at some point. Some of the ones in midlife are not nearly so impatient about actually taking the agenda forward. So from the developing brain point of view, from those early years point of view, it is really important to have enhanced early environments. Neglected early environments, we have lots of examples of this, of difficult periods in history and difficult periods in the world where people are brought up in adverse environments, their effect on cognitive development and social development is extremely serious. So enhancing early environments is really important. And enhancement means everything. It means physical activities. We've typically taught you know, PE for years in schools, although there's some question now about whether kids are as physically active as they were. There's the educational enhancement, but there's also the social enhancement. One of the really big challenges at the moment is the extent to which children actually spend less time with adults outside their own family than in previous generations. The notion, my personal hate, the notion of homeschooling. <laughs> if you stayed at home with your parents all the time, this would be good for you. As my children would say, it is obviously bad. And please share us with the grandparents, with the aunts, with the uncles, anybody out there who actually has a different way of relating to the world on an ongoing basis. These are critical in terms of learning the variety and diversity of social engagements and in terms of brain activity that run with you. Clearly having a, a, environments in which people have the most opportunity for education is made clear. It's not so made clear the extent to which people need emotional environments to maintain those developments as well. Being smart in the human sense comes back to that IQ thing, but also that emotional IQ thing, how to behave in appropriate ways, how to understand others, how to develop a fundamental kind of empathy and understanding of the emotional environment which actually drives behaviour on an ongoing basis. There are a whole lot of policy implications in this area about the advantages of early education, but also picking up very early those who are struggling, through no fault of their own, have developmental difficulties tied up with their genes, their disorders, their social environments that are causing adverse effects. Now, at the social level, we've seen a lot of increasing policy support for families in trouble. In the learning disability area, this area is not nearly so advanced. And we've seen, uh, and under the previous Prime Minister, some discussion about increased screening in the preschool area. 
but no real serious commitment that if you screen and you find problems, you're actually going to do anything about it. And the rest of health, we consider that an unethical thing to do, to screen and not intervene. However, we have had serious sort of discussions going on in the educational environment. Oh, yeah, we'll identify these problems and somehow we'll just sort of note them. You know, there's a very bad thing to do, actually. If you note them, the whole drive of this science at the moment is to intervene and then to look for better interventions on an ongoing basis. So we need serious public policies that support family and kin structures and assist those at risk. And, in fact, one of the... I don't have many good things to say about the um, current period of the Labor government, but one of the very good things that's happened... In fact, something led by Jenny Macklin, uh, who, who many people may or may not know, was actually the principal author of what was our National Mental Health Strategy with Brian Howe back in 1993, about looking at enhancing systems for protecting children and actually not focusing on child protection and notification, but building a public health around helping families and those in trouble to provide better environments to the maximum number of families in trouble, rather than as being bad families on an ongoing basis, which does nobody any good on an ongoing basis. And that, unlike many other pieces of uh, discussion in the last few years that have gone nowhere, is actually a very significant shift in social policy under her stewardship that will have long-term, hopefully, consequences. Now, from a brain development point of view, to show you a slightly different view of the uh, synaptic development I was showing on to make a diff slightly different point, is that the brain doesn't develop in all regions at the same rate. A yellow-red colour here is a relatively immature brain which hasn't started pruning and organising itself to be more efficient. The blue purple colours is a more efficient type area. Now, what you can see in a five-year-old is the front part of the brain. Let's call this the adult part or the most human part. This has got to do with making complex decisions, understanding other people, understanding the ramifications of your actions, conceptual thinking, planning the future, all that stuff. Right? Five-year-olds don't do a lot of it. Right? The paddle pop's there, they want the paddle pop now. You in the paddle pop, they want the paddle pop again. <laughs> They want it now, you know? They're very much driven by the basic stimuli they see, but they develop other capacities. This is the primary motor cortex. They learn to kick soccer balls very efficiently and very quickly at this particular age, and those primary motor skills, and this is the visual cortex at the back, actually do develop very quickly. So they become motor and visual things, and if any of you have ever competed with a five-year-old with a soccer ball when you're my age, you'll lose, right? They're very good at it. They're not so good at, you know, taking into account that it's actually causing you some distress to realise that you're not so good at it. They'll just keep doing it. Throughout the primary school period, those sorts of issues related to language and motor development continue. And very little, in fact, in terms of frontal lobe development happens in the pre-pubertal period. I'm always terribly amused by parents who are trying to do, have rational arguments and discussions with their six- and seven-year-old kids. I just wonder who they think they're talking to, you know, because <laughs> really they're having a different kind of discussion. It's really in the pubertal period that this frontal lobe development starts to happen and in reality doesn't happen until quite late in the adolescent period. So, in fact, we see the most development, in fact, in the 15 to sort of early 20 period and right through into the early 20s. People have not necessarily, and boys later than girls, necessarily reached that point of much more reflective thinking, much more of having found the stop button rather than doing the same dumb thing 20 times in a row just because it was fun, actually thinking about necessarily the long-term consequences of what necessarily happens on a basis. Now, this creates a very interesting kind of dilemma of being sexually mature in your early teens, but having a long way to go in terms of cognitive maturity. Of course, from an evolutionary point of view, people suggest that this is exactly how it should be. You have lots of children before you realise the ramifications <laughs> of having lots of children. And if you'd thought about it, you might have decided to have had none in a more selfish kind of way. And it has been suggested that, in fact, the period of adolescence in our current world and current development is actually getting longer on an ongoing basis. And we're not sure while puberty itself is getting shorter. There's another interesting trend going on, and you may have seen some research published recently about the age of puberty in African-Americans, for example, heading down towards the age of seven in girls. So we have an interesting kind of thing going on which we don't understand whether it's related to obesity or other cultural factors, that the age of sexual maturity might be moving earlier, <laughs> while the area of brain maturity is quite late. And that gap in the middle is this key adolescent kind of period. The adolescent period is not only about getting frontal lobes, it's about developing the stop button. The, stop, the, the subcortical structures or the primitive brain or the bit we show with all the other animals, which is go out, find sex, find food, find fun, remember to sleep at night, we share with all the other animal world is the subcortical part of the brain. The cortical bit develops over the top and develops connections, particularly during the adolescent period, that tend to inhibit. Most brain development is actually about inhibition. It's actually about stopping things that are otherwise built in. Very critical period of that is during the adolescent and late adolescent period. 
And those degrees of change in structure are correlated with changes in neuropsychological tests of those of simple correlations of those developments, showing that those pictures that we take are correlated with changes in actual cognitive tests of decision making and of what we would consider the more sophisticated adult cognitive functions. So, for the adolescent period, and very much important to universities and ongoing post, there's, I must say, there's absolutely nothing magical about 1718. The idea that suddenly 1718 means something from a brain point of view is meaningless, actually, from a brain point of view. And the whole idea that we withdraw what my colleague Pat McGorry this Australian year refers to as the social scaffolding of schools and other supports and suddenly say, that's it, you're on your own, you're now an independent thinking adult, from a brain point of view, makes no sense at all. In fact, you could argue the complete opposite and the great role of potentially colleges like this and other, other institutions is continuing in a different way to provide the social scaffolding and the wrapping around and the experiences that a lot of young people need during those periods. So during those periods, and what, what I mean by adolescent here is not something that ends at 17, 18, I mean really into the early 20s, is something about maximising education. It's also about maximising socialisation. It's an interesting kind of idea. I find myself in argument constantly with um, principals of, of certain schools in these areas about the goal of going to school is to get a HSC school. And they go, no, it isn't. The goal of going to school is to end up being an independent, able, capable person, which will require not just studying, it will require spending time with people. It will require developing relationships, to which the principals always say to me, that's not what the parents want. I go, I'm a parent. That's what I want. I want to be able to move these kids out of my house independently sometime and get my life back. I want them to have these capacities on an ongoing basis. And that requires social opportunity and considered social opportunity in an ongoing way. And we need to maximise the connection between those sets of issues in, in real ways, and just not just in the social ways, but in other ways that are physically relevant. I'll return to this issue about circadian systems, what people's sleep-wake cycles are, how they live their lives, how they do that in a way that's physiologically relevant during this period, as well as trying to protect against harm during those periods. The one most discussed in our society, fortunately now and on the agenda, that of adolescent alcohol use and of teenage alcohol use and that associated with harm. A lot of the agenda now is not just related to the physical harm and the social harm, but the brain harm associated with continuing high levels of alcohol and drug use during this period and the social attitudes to that. I am tied up with a wider social movement with something my kids really, and some of my other relatives, younger relatives, will barely forgive me for, which is trying to lift the drinking age and a series of other movements based on actually trying to protect developing brains. If you say that the science now is you don't have a mature brain until your early 20s, then there's no more reason at this age to be less concerned than if you're less concerned about exposing five-year-olds to alcohol or exposing pregnant women to alcohol. You're talking about the same effects of alcohol on developing brain structures right throughout this whole period. It isn't just the alcohol exposure, it's the pattern of drinking, particularly the pattern of binge drinking, which in younger people is quite different. In older people, tend to drink less and fall asleep when they drink. Younger people are much more highly aroused. Their reticular activating systems, their on systems are much more on. They continue to drink at high levels. Then we provide them and we encourage them to drink other things like stimulating drinks, caffeine-laced drinks, to stay awake while they're drinking alcohol to get their alcohol to the highest possible level. That's part of the normal social process made famous in some places in this university and the wider culture in which we kind of exist as a normal thing to do. It's an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And that pattern of binge drinking actually is severely toxic to the developing brain. Now, the, re the reason the age matters is not just related to the age of exposure relative to age of development. When the age of drinking, legal drinking, was 21, the effective age of drinking was 18, 19. Since we've moved the effective age of drinking, legal age, to 18, the most recent statistics, the effective age of drinking now is 15. So actually what we're doing is saying to our 15-year-olds, it's fine to go damaging these areas of the brain, which are actually of major social importance. Other issues that arise during this period which are really important are the onset of mental illnesses, which themselves affect the brain, which I'll come to later on. But just in terms of the alcohol effects, and if you think I was talking about knocking the sort of leaves off the tree before, alcohol literally knocks the branches off the trees. These are the connections and the, of nerve cells and the extent to which the dendritic tree is in fact knocked out by alcohol and certainly the pattern of binge drinking uh, on an ongoing basis. And you can now measure this, the parts of the brain in young people who binge drink and their particular effects. And just to draw your attention uh, to this particular area of looking at the frontal cortex, that bit that makes all the decisions, or the hippocampus, that thing that shrinks in Alzheimer's disease and dementia, are both severely affected by binge drinking in young people. So from the brain sort of 
imaging evidence, we now have a direct evidence of what is actually happening in those young people. It's not something that just goes away. Unfortunately, alcohol-related policy in this country is something that could be best to be described as fearful and reactive. Premiers in flight you know, from anything that might be seen to be unpopular. In most of our work with young people, the idea of moving the drinking age, actually, and particularly amongst young women, is quite popular, not unpopular in many ways. That the degree of harm that is associated, and the social difficulties are associated with high levels of drinking in young people, is much more contested in young people than you would think. It's much more a previous generation, my generation, and the political generation of my age that is scared, witless, of what will happen if it does anything in the alcohol-related area. It's an area in which we need community attitudes, and I might say, well, I'm here in places like this in our university and in places like this international house, but we need to really see, think about our attitudes, and we are seriously in need of community leadership models in this area. People, as in the smoking area previously and other areas, have said we need to do different. We have new evidence, we have new, new attitudes, we need to think differently. In fact, you may have seen in the Sydney Morning Herald just this morning the extent to which New Zealand <laughs> has actually taken this issue and had serious inquiries and the previous Attorney-General was responsible for dropping the drinking age in New Zealand has now decided, bad idea. New evidence, look at the effect, got to change my mind. That's kind of interesting, a politician who can realise they made a mistake and actually perhaps we should do different. There are issues I've alluded to then about uh, alcohol at early ages and there are other sets of uh, taxation and access issues which are terribly relevant. So we're involved in this particular set of issues of making recommendations in that particular area. They're the serious options, raise the drinking age, change the licensing laws, introduce appropriate taxation. What we're likely to see are the less serious actions and we're likely to see very little change at this point unless the community discourse comes to another level. Unless people say, like we did in the smoking area and many other areas, sometimes we have to change our social attitudes in the face of the new science and some might say the common sense.